Um, thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much for being with us. We, we were just talking with uh, Dr. Ramanathan of uh, Scripps, and he was talking about uh, the, the possibility of, uh, you know, human extinction or, or certainly destruction of, of civilization. Uh, you've done some math on this that you've been quoted rather extensively. Tell us what, you, what your understanding is of the situation right now with regard to climate change and the direction that we're moving. Um, so I suppose you're referring to the paper I published in Science Advances last week. Yes. And um, in that paper, I didn't address global warming head-on so much as the consequences of putting CO2 into the atmosphere. And uh, it, it's more specifically, eventually that CO2 goes into the oceans. <clears throat> and I addressed the consequences of the, uh, of the CO2 into, into the oceans. And, and I did it in a, um, a way that I, I think it would be fair to say is indirect. Basically, I, I studied the, uh, the record of ancient events in the carbon cycle, that is, uh, past disruptions of the carbon cycle, and the carbon cycle being a loop between photosynthesis, which takes CO2 out of the um, atmosphere and oceans, and respiration, which is what we do, which brings it back when we consume the organic matter made by CO2. And in studying the past events, I basically considered two types of events. Um, one, those that are associated with mass extinctions, and uh, the other are those which were not. And so the, the issue is, is that every time there's been a mass extinction in the last 540 million years, there's been a clear disruption, a very serious disruption of the carbon cycle. On the other hand, um, there are also many serious disruptions of the carbon cycle in which there's been no mass extinction. So I tried to address um, the difference between these two and to see if you know, one can conclude. You're talking about things like the PETM? Oh, so you're 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 au courant, as I say, right? <laughs> you seem to know. Well, that, that I mean, that okay. that some would argue that that was an extinction event. It just wasn't a mass extinction event. It was a minor extinction event. So the PETM, for your listeners, the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, <laughs> an event right. about 55 million years ago, um, is associated with the extinction of some benthic foraminifera, but not widespread mass extinction. And that, that's one of the conundrums, because the PETM is one of the most um, you know, well-studied events in, in the geologic record. It's a clear disruption, clear signs of warming, clear signs of ocean acidification, but not much of a, a biotic impact. And so the question is, what sets these apart? And, so I, and what does? Um, so um, what I found is that um, I basically began with a hypothesis, and the hypothesis... Um, Part of it um, will sound familiar, and that's the idea that the rate at which CO2 levels increase matters, right? And so one, one thinks that uh, it's natural to imagine that the faster you pump CO2 into the atmosphere and or the oceans, the, the, the more dangerous it is for, the, you know, for, for ecosystems. And so that's basically saying rates matter. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, I started thinking, well, what happens if it happens really fast? Like, what happens if it happens now during the radio show, right? And then um, you, know, you raise CO2 levels, say, only one part per million, one four hundredth of their present level. Well, you and I will leave our rooms, eventually go outside, and if it went up one ppm, we wouldn't notice anything. However, the rate at which it happened would have been infinite. Right? And so, therefore, it had to be a little bit more um, richer than just rates because the idea of there being a critical rate applies to time scales that are sufficiently long. And when the time scales, on the other hand, are sufficiently short, like instantaneous, then it becomes a matter of how much. So it's like how much or how fast. Right. Right? And um, I found a way of connecting the two. <clears throat> And they, they connect how much to how fast um, via the time scale that separates fast from slow. And this allowed me to predict how much, uh, also by studying the data, but allowed me to predict from the study of the ancient events, which are slower, it allowed me to predict how much of a change today would bring us into this zone where in the past it would be associated with mass extinction. Okay. 
And so the the answer to how much is a number, it's about 310 gigatons of carbon, um, which following basically every projection um, that's been made is a number that will reach sometime this century. And that's 300 gigatons going into the ocean. We, we, we put it into the atmosphere and then some of it gets absorbed. Haven't we put, uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, something on the order of 500 gigatons? Uh, I think it's a little bit more than that. I think uh -huh. it's not a fact. Uh, I, I actually, I, I don't remember the number. So, You're right. It's more than the 300. However, right. a lot stays in the ocean. I mean, a lot stays in the atmosphere. Right. A lot gets taken up by land. Mm. And I'm specifically referring to how much is absorbed in the ocean. I see. And, and the reason I'm doing that is um, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, the, the, the study really only addresses things that happen, I would say, at time scales of 100 to 1,000 years at the fastest, because it implicitly assumes an equilibration between the atmosphere and oceans. And secondly, all of the, the data for mass extinction that exists in the geologic record, or most of it, let's just say the, the highest quality data, exists from marine life. And, so, mm. and, and it seems usually mass extinctions started in the oceans, do they not? Oh, uh, I think in certain cases it's unclear, and you can take the case of you know the famous KT or Cretaceous tertiary extinction yeah. that killed the dinosaurs. So, you know, if following um, the standard view now that it was a bolide and bolide impact, then you, you would think something started in the atmosphere. Right, but the Permian, uh, the, the 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 most severe part, the beginning of the most severe part of it began in the ocean, as I recall. But, um, well, or maybe I, we're I not sure. I don't think we know enough to say that for yeah. any extinction with any authority. The, the, the real issue is that the best data comes from the oceans because it's reasonably homogeneous. Uh, and, and, and also sedimentary rock and all that, you know, you, 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 you simply have a whole lot more material to look at. Uh, right, it, that. And there's one other element here. Um, my study is is based on what we call the carbon isotopic records, the isotopic composition of carbon buried in the sedimentary rock you just referred to. Right. And that isotopic composition is really only reliable as an indicator of the atmosphere and oceans when it comes from uh, marine sediments. Mm. Okay. So, so, but, so to get, we're, we just have a couple minutes left here. Uh, we're talking with Professor Daniel Rothman of MIT. What, what specifically do people need to know about what you learned and what can we do with that information? So I'd say there are many things that have been learned, but insofar as the case of the sixth extinction that you were alluding to earlier, the point is, is that uh, the results of my study suggest that the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere um, sometime in the com in, during the current century would be sufficient to, so to speak, launch a major extinction event. And by launch, what I mean is put the Earth system, that is the atmosphere, the oceans, and the life that it supports, on a trajectory which, if left unchecked over a period of about 10,000 years, um, would engage in an unstable trajectory so that it would lead to an extinction event, which would basically start, you know, sometime in the near future and continue and reach its worst level, you know, far into the future. So if you wish, the take-home message is that there are other things that are unhealthy um, to the planet about putting CO2 in the atmosphere besides global warming. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're basically talking about ocean acidification. Right, killing off the ocean. And, 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 the, and con the contribution of my study is to basically say how much is too much. Right, and with that, and when you say a mass extinction, are you talking an extinction that would include top predators like you and me, humans? Um, I, I hesitate to go that far. I, the this, this study basically addresses the data for you know marine invertebrates, that is organisms with shells. The shells have a lot, you know, these organisms have a hard time making their shells when the oceans become acidic. Right. Um, one could imagine that things become bad all around, but that the study doesn't really um, identify mechanisms. It's basically putting the data together, trying to make this connection between the past and the future. And, and, and you're, you're more or less suggesting that we have a carbon budget of around 300, giga, 300 uh, gigatons of carbon that we can emit before 
It, no, 300 gigatons that we can allow to go into the oceans. But into the basically oceans, Basically about okay. twice as much gets emitted um, okay. uh, compared to how much is and, and, and in the near term. Any sense of how many years that gives us until we have to really decarbonize our, our economy? Well, I mean, the, the, it depends on you know, how things develop, but the, the paper basically says as a round number, you know, that this, this um, threshold would be crossed sometime this century, the latter half of this century. Uh, I mean, nothing, you know, terrible happens the next day. I mean, it's just, sure. saying that this is, this, this is when we end up on this trajectory. And so the obvious way to not get there or the obvious way to uh, retract it back once you get there is to not put as much CO2 into right, it. Right, because the only way to know that you're actually in an extinction event is in retrospect, it seems, <laughs> right? 